Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. It feels like it's been forever since I've sat down to record a video and to talk to you guys, and that's because it has. And it has nothing to do with uh, the holiday and everything because, you know, that's only a couple days. It has to do with the fact that I was very sick, very sick for the past 10, uh, 10 days, like death's door. And I'm still not feeling great. I'm still not 100%. I got my Kleenex and, uh, you know, my water, my fluids, all of that. So I'm, I'm getting better. Um, but, you know, you might see me from time to time take this sweater off, put it back on because my temperature is constantly changing. But the show must go on. And I'm so so ready to talk to you guys about this case today. It was a case that I had heard of before, like I knew the names involved, but I had never really gotten deep into the details. And once I started, I couldn't stop. Um, very, very sad case with a lot that goes into it, a lot that, you know, brought us up to the moment where this poor young woman lost her life. So today's video is going to be a long one, and this this case is probably going to be in three parts, and that's what we're doing this month. Very exciting. So just grab a snack or grab a drink. I can't taste anything, so you guys let me know what your snack and drink tastes like so I can live vicariously through you. This is the story of two people, one who did not live a beautiful life, who had to struggle and fight for every scrap she got, who was born into chaos and emerged from it with a deep need for order and acceptance. This was a person who had the biggest smile and the loudest laugh, who was full of jokes and fun, but all of that was covering up a deep sense of abandonment, betrayal, and pain. The other person did live a beautiful life from the moment he entered this world. He was born into wealth, privilege, the entire world and universe of education, connections, and opportunities laid at his feet. He had two hardworking and supportive parents who supported him and built him up, and he would later marry a wonderful woman who also supported him and built him up and gave him four beautiful children, all born happy and healthy. For this man, there were no roadblocks, no adversity, no problems, and yet he was a man for whom enough is never enough and whose controlling and narcissistic drives functioned only to benefit himself. This is the story of Anne-Marie Fahey and the man who killed her. Before we dive in, let's have a quick word from the sponsor of today's video, Glasses USA. Now, it's plain to see that I wear glasses, because you're looking at me, and I always have worn glasses since I was a little itty bitty girl. Look at these pictures of me and my frizzy hair and my glasses looking very solemn and miserable for the most part. Except for this picture here with Eeyore. I look pumped. Maybe I was looking so solemn and miserable because I always hated wearing glasses. I thought if I could just get rid of those glasses, I would be so much hotter and better and more popular. Well, the moral of the story is that during my adult life, I came to accept my glasses, but also more than that, I began to love and embrace them as a part of me. And now I want more glasses to wear with different outfits to achieve different aesthetics. But that can get really pricey. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription glasses and sunglasses at up to 70% off retail prices. Now I can shop for all my eyewear needs online with affordable prices without leaving the comfort of my home. And I don't ever want to leave the comfort of my home, especially after this, this sickness. Like, I'm going to stay inside my bubble. GlassesUSA.com has over 9,000 styles of glasses, including in-house brands like Muse and Amelia E. For instance, these glasses that I'm wearing right now, these frames are the Muse Norma. I'm actually going to wear these for the rest of the video because I really, really really like them and I like the gradient color change. It's darker here and it gets lighter down. Or these little cuties I'm wearing right now. These are the Muse Kylie in blue and I actually have the Muse Kylie in multiple different colors. I have them in red and black as well. Oh and green. But they also have designer brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Armani, and more. One of my favorite pair of glasses to wear on a daily basis are these. These are the Coach HC6078 frames. I think they're real sharp and they're lightweight but they look good on my face too. And they're easy for me to wear when I'm, play when I'm playing VR, the Oculus Quest, because when you put the, head the headset on, if your glasses are too big or like too round, 
it's not going to work. These are perfect when I'm playing VR. But Glasses USA has sunglasses as well. I never leave the house without a pair of sunglasses on, and I have a million sunglasses from Glasses USA. It's probably my favorite part. I love these so much. They're green. They give me real, like, 1950s vibes. You probably have seen me wearing these on Instagram all the time. These are the Muse Classics in green. I love them. And GlassesUSA.com has a bunch of different glasses, specialty glasses like sports glasses, you know, kids' glasses, safety glasses, and more. Almost all pairs can be ordered in your prescription and with blue light black coating as well. And if you're feeling overwhelmed by all of the choices, GlassesUSA.com has a quiz you can take that only will take you one minute, but it will suggest the right pair of glasses for your face shape and needs. GlassesUSA.com is another tool that will help you decide if a pair of frames is right for you. Their virtual try-on tool is amazing, and it allows you to see what each pair will look like on your face without you having to like go to a store and try them on in person, so you can relax, sip a glass of wine, have a little glasses fashion show, right from the comfort of your favorite armchair. Sounds awesome. A complete pair of eyeglasses or sunglasses starts at only $30, and basic prescription lenses are included with every frame, which is so great. That means $30 for the lens and the frame. Even premium frames, like Ray-Ban and Oakley, come with the basic prescription lenses. And the lenses are the same high quality you'll find in any glasses store, but they're made in Glasses USA's own state-of-the-art labs. Shopping online at GlassesUSA.com means a completely risk-free shopping experience, free shipping, free returns, and a 100% money-back guarantee if you don't love your glasses within 14 days of delivery, no questions asked. So my only question is, what are you waiting for? You know, there's nothing to lose, everything to gain. Save yourself money, save yourself time, save yourself stress and agitation. Just go on GlassesUSA.com and choose from a huge selection of frames that will up your glasses game in no time at all. All the links to my glasses are in the description box. Thank you so much to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video, and let's dive in. Today's case brings us to Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington is an interesting city with a long and textured history. It is considered the urban hub of the region and the corporate capital of America, since Delaware is considered to be a corporate tax haven. Roughly 300,000 businesses use Delaware as their legal address, including business titans like American Airlines, Apple, Bank of America, GE, Coca-Cola, Ford, Walmart, and the list goes on and on, to the point where nearly half of all public corporations in the United States are incorporated in Delaware because the state has very attractive tax laws for huge corporations who want to keep as much money in their pockets as humanly possible. But it is also undoubtedly a beautiful and interesting state, especially Wilmington, which owes much of its economic growth to the DuPont family. Visit Wilmington.com described the city perfectly when they said, quote, Wilmington and the Brandywine Valley is like a riveting romantic tale of two cultures, two centuries, even two different worlds, a destination marked by sharp contrasts. Town and gardens, past and present, commerce and culture, beauty and brains, gritty and gorgeous, historic and hip. It is these contrasts that make each experience more vibrant, each moment more distinct, and each sight more authentic and beautiful, end quote. So we have this bustling economic hub in Wilmington, and then you have the Brandywine Valley. So driving from the city to the valley is truly like going back in time. Perfectly manicured gardens, right? And I'm talking Alice in Wonderland, red queen, painting the roses red kind of gardens. Real nice. Sprawling estates like Downton Abbey style. The true definition of generational wealth and opulence that most of us could never even dream of. And those who enjoy spending an afternoon or a weekend strolling around and gaping open-mouthed at these sites can thank the DuPont family. Pierre Samuel DuPont de Nemours was the son of a Paris watchman who decided to try out his luck in the New World, America, where the streets are paved with cheese and there's no cats anywhere. He arrived with his two sons in the year 1800, and two years later, one of those sons opened a gunpowder mill on the banks of Brandywine Creek, and hence the DuPont Empire was born. And in 2020, they're still going, right? They're still on the Forbes list of America's richest families, number 17 to be exact. They started selling brandy wine powder, which was just gunpowder. And during the War of 1812, the DuPonts sold more than 1 million pounds of powder to the U.S. government, profiting about $2 million in today's money. 
By the time the 20th century rolled around, the family was doing more than just making gunpowder. They had become one of the top competitors in the chemical-based business, developing substances like freon, neoprene, lucite, nylon, teflon, lycra, and kevlar. And they built things, too, specifically gorgeous mansions, just channeling that great Gatsby vibe with everything they had. Walking by these estates now, you can almost hear the notes from the orchestras that would play for hours as the socialites danced. You can almost hear the clink of champagne glasses and the laughter from young women whose biggest concerns would have been how tight their corsets were and which wealthy man they would be engaged to. Delaware is a small state, just 100 miles long and 35 miles wide, and the assistant editor of the News Journal once said that instead of six degrees of separation, Delawareans dealt with two degrees of separation. It seemed like everyone either knew everyone else or knew of them, whether it be through school, work, church, or social activities. And don't take my word for it, because as we go through this case, you'll see it in action. And Wilmington, Delaware, was where Anne Marie Fahey was born and raised, even if she pretty much raised herself. It was where most of her siblings lived. It was where she worked as the scheduling secretary for Delaware's governor, Tom Carper. And it was where her boyfriend of one year lived, a boyfriend she had been gradually getting closer to, a boyfriend she had told her friends and family that she thought could be the one. This man's name was Michael Scanlon, an executive at the MBNA Bank, whose headquarters were based out of Wilmington. Mike was 31 and single when he received an email from the governor of Delaware, Tom Carper, a conversation focused on business for the most part, but an end note from Tom Carper suggested that Mike should call a young woman who had been working for Carper. Carper thought that Mike and his scheduling secretary, Anne Marie, would hit it off. Mike Scanlon came from a prominent Rhode Island family. He had all the benefits of their money and connections, including a private education to start him off right. Before he was 30, Scanlon was making six figures a year, driving a Mercedes convertible, and living in a very nice house all by himself. All he needed now was to find someone to share it with. The relationship with Anne Marie had started off a bit rocky, considering they had chosen a loud pub for their first date. They could barely hear each other over the music and the talking. But even then, Mike Scanlon was Twitter-pated with Anne Marie Fahey. She was a tall, slim brunette with a quick wit and an even quicker smile. And he later told a friend that he'd had a great time with her. They continued to see each other regularly, and Mike even let Anne-Marie pick out the tile and wallpaper for his kitchen when he redecorated it, and he had brought her home with him to Rhode Island over Memorial Day weekend to meet his parents. It certainly looked like their relationship was headed towards marriage, and Anne-Marie had been talking to her sister Kathleen about who she wanted to be a bridesmaid at her wedding to Mike, or Miguel, as she called him, as a nickname. Because Anne-Marie had spent a semester in Spain, she was fluent in Spanish, and she liked to call people uh, their Spanish counterpart names, sometimes as like pet names, and she called Mike Miguel. But in June of 1996, Mike had been trying to get a hold of his girlfriend for several days, but she hadn't gotten back to him, and this was very out of character for the organized and structured woman whose family and friends had given her the nickname Anal Annie. On the evening of Thursday, June 27th, Mike had called Anne Marie's apartment just before 7 p.m., and he'd left her a message telling her that he had an event to attend that evening. It was some barbecue with his interns, but he said he would be home by 9. At 9.30 that night, Mike called back and left another message telling Anne Marie that he was going to head over to a bar on the west side called Kid Shellens, and he said he would love it if she joined him there. He called back 15 minutes after this and left a message saying that he was now leaving and headed to the bar, and he hoped he would see her there. But Anne Marie did not walk into Kid Shellens that night, and she did not return any of his calls or messages. Mike called back the next afternoon on Friday, June 28th, simply asking Anne Marie to call him back so he knew that she was okay. The next day, Mike decided to drive by his girlfriend's apartment, located at 1718 Washington Street. And he saw that her green Jetta was parked outside, but he didn't go up and knock on her door, probably because he didn't want her to think he was stalking her or checking up on her or he was like a possessive boyfriend or something. But Mike did know that they had plans with Anne-Marie's older brother, Robert, and Robert's wife, Susan, that night. 
Robert wanted to learn more about the man that his little sister had fallen for, and the plan had been that Anne-Marie and Mike would meet Robert and his wife at 6.30 at Robert's house, and they would all drive over to the Overbrook Golf Club for dinner reservations at 7.30. But the time for the meeting and the dinner came and went, and Mike had still not heard from Anne-Marie, nor did he know where she was. So he called Anne-Marie's older sister Kathleen, and he told Kathleen that he hadn't seen or heard from Anne-Marie in days. And when Kathleen thought about it, she realized she hadn't really talked to her sister for a while either, although she had been calling and leaving messages for her. The last time Kathleen had seen her sister was the previous Wednesday night when Anne-Marie had come over for dinner, as she did every week on Wednesday night. Sometimes on Wednesdays, Anne-Marie would bring over laundry to do while she was visiting with Kathleen and Kathleen's children, But according to Kathleen, quote, This day she didn't do her laundry. My husband's car was being serviced and he was out of town and Anne-Marie helped me. We all drove up in my car to pick up Pat's car and then she drove my car home. She stayed and had dinner and then she went to the gym, end quote. Kathleen said that Anne-Marie talked to her about her plans to leave the governor's office and go back to school to get her degree in education so that she could teach. Anne-Marie loved children and they loved her back. And Anne-Marie wasn't making a ton of money at the governor's office, just over $30,000 a year, and she had recently asked for a raise and been told no, so she was kind of looking for a change of scenery. Now, Kathleen didn't think that there was anything wrong with her sister that Wednesday night. Anne-Marie seemed to be in good spirits, even though the two women had fought briefly the previous weekend when the sisters had been shopping at Talbot's, and Anne-Marie had tried on a very expensive pantsuit, saying she wanted to buy it. When Anne-Marie tried on the pantsuit, Kathleen noticed how thin her sister had become, and she could see Anne-Marie's ribs poking through her skin. She was alarmed. She would later say, quote, She looked so thin when she tried on the suit. I hadn't noticed. She'd wear jeans and a baggy sweatshirt when she came over to the house. But at Talbot's, when she came out of the dressing room, I could see how thin she was, end quote. Kathleen also reprimanded Anne-Marie for even considering buying an outfit that cost $300, knowing how little her sister made at work. And it was an unnecessary expense, and Anne-Marie didn't have any savings. It was just kind of something that Kathleen, as an older sister, suggested she shouldn't do. But when Kathleen had seen Anne-Marie just a few days later, she didn't seem to be holding on to any anger or resentment about this little argument, and she was in a good mood. Kathleen started calling some of Anne-Marie's friends, co-workers. She also called her older brother, Robert, who was still waiting for Anne-Marie at the club. Robert hadn't heard from her. None of Anne-Marie's co-workers or friends had heard from her in days. And Kathleen realized that it had been at least three days since anyone had talked to Anne-Marie, much less seen her. So Kathleen called the Wilmington Police Department and she told them that her sister was missing. And Anne-Marie was not the type to just drop off the map and not tell anyone. She was very, uh, very organized, right? She was on top of everything. She was not the kind of person to drop the ball. And she definitely was not the kind of person to just fall out of contact and not let her family know where she was because they were a very tight-knit Irish Catholic family, a big family, lots of brothers and sisters. And they were very close. They talked to each other. Anne-Marie would know that if she just disappeared, her siblings would be incredibly worried about her. So after hanging up with the Wilmington police, Kathleen called Anne-Marie's boyfriend, Mike Scanlon, back, and she told him to meet her at Anne-Marie's apartment, located across the street from Brandywine Park. Now, this was not the safest area at the time. I'm not sure what it's like right now, but at the time, it wasn't a super safe area, like not a place you would want to walk around after dark. And it had been considered a location of rising crime for the previous few years, with rival gangs shooting at each other in the street, muggings of residents who were strolling through the park in broad daylight. So as Kathleen pulled up to Anne-Marie's apartment, she wondered if maybe her sister had encountered foul play, if maybe she'd been attacked or taken. Kathleen and Mike were let into Anne-Marie's apartment by her landlord, who was also worried about Anne-Marie, and they were immediately hit in the face with the pungent odor of something rotting or decaying. They quickly identified the source of this smell. On the kitchen counter, there were various groceries, overripe bananas, pretzels, rice aroni, and then hidden under some trash in the garbage can, there was mushrooms that had gone rancid, and those mushrooms were emitting the most horrible smell that had ended up permeating the entire apartment. Kathleen immediately knew something was wrong because of this. Anne-Marie was obsessed with keeping everything neat, 
tidy, and orderly. Her apartment was always spotless. She organized her CDs in alphabetical order. She hung her clothes in her closet by height and type. She would even fold her dirty clothes before stacking them neatly in the dirty clothes hamper. I've never heard of anyone doing that. That is next level OCD, I think. But Kathleen knew that Anne Marie would have never brought groceries home and then left them on the counter. And she wouldn't have gone away for a day or more without taking her garbage out. In the bedroom, Anne Marie's bed was a rumpled mess. The covers had been pulled back haphazardly and everyone knew Anne Marie made her bed first thing every morning. She would even sometimes put a mint on her pillow before heading out for the day so it would be waiting for her when she got home and got into bed that evening. There were clothes pulled down in the closet, dry cleaning bags with clothes in them, dry cleaning bags without clothes in them, just littered the floor of the closet. There was random shoe boxes thrown all over and Kathleen spotted a red Talbot's box. So she peered inside curiously to find out if it contained the tan pantsuit that Anne Marie had been willing to pay $300 for. It did, so Kathleen assumed, well, Anne-Marie must have gone back and bought this pantsuit after we left Talbot's. The main thing that Kathleen had wanted to check for in Anne-Marie's apartment was her suitcases, because if Anne-Marie's suitcases were there, it would mean that she hadn't been planning to go away for, you know, an overnight trip or a several-day trip. And Anne-Marie's suitcases were still in her apartment, but so was her purse with her checkbook, her driver's license, her passport, and $40 in cash. But Kathleen and Mike noticed that Anne Marie's keys were missing. She always clipped her house and her car key to a three inch leather case that contained mace, you know, like pepper spray. And that was nowhere to be found. But her Jetta, her car, was still parked outside. Now, both Kathleen and Mike knew that Anne Marie would never have left her apartment in this state. Not when she was home, not if she knew she was going to be leaving. And there didn't appear to have been a robbery. So what had happened to Anne-Marie, what had happened to her apartment, and where was she now? In the living room, Kathleen smiled when she saw her sister's calendar. And apparently Anne-Marie had marked the date of her monthly anniversary with Mike Scanlon every single month. And there was a little heart, and it said Miguel in it. And it was just a cute and thoughtful thing that Anne-Marie did. And Anne-Marie in general was a very cute and thoughtful person. But in a drawer... Kathleen found something that would cast doubt on everything she knew about her little sister. She found several letters written and signed by a man who was not Mike Scanlon. Kathleen recognized the name of the author, but she couldn't believe her eyes. And later she would say that reading those letters was like a kick in the stomach. Not long after this, a rainbow notebook would be found in the dining room of Anne Marie's apartment, a notebook she had been using as a diary. The first entry dated March 22nd, 1994, said, quote, I have fallen in love with a very special person whose name I choose to leave anonymous. We know who each other are. It happened the night of my 28th birthday. We have built an everlasting friendship, end quote. But the final entry in Anne Marie's journal, dated April 7th, 1996, showed a completely different tone and revealed that what Anne-Marie had once considered to be an everlasting friendship had evolved into something much darker. She wrote, quote, I have finally brought closure to Tom Capano. What a controlling, manipulative, insecure, jealous maniac, end quote. Now Kathleen knew who Thomas Capano was. Of course she did. It was impossible to live in Wilmington and not be familiar with the politically connected lawyer and his wealthy and powerful family. Thomas Capano seemed to have it all. He was a managing partner at one of Delaware's biggest law firms. He was incredibly rich. He had a beautiful wife, four beautiful daughters, and they all lived together in a beautiful home. Thomas Capano had a beautiful life. Anyone would have looked at him and said, he's made it. But it seemed that Thomas Capano was also a man with an insatiable appetite. Now, it is important to know who he was and where he came from, and it's important to understand the same thing about Anne-Marie Fahey. So, as always, to understand what happened at the end, we have to go back to the beginning. Thomas Joseph Capano was born on October 11, 1949, in Wilmington, Delaware. And by the time he opened his little baby eyes for the very first time, his father, Louis J. Capano, had built a successful empire to ensure that his children would be the benefactors of more money and privilege 
than many of us can even imagine. Louis Capano had immigrated from Italy as a young boy, bringing with him the skill of a carpenter, a skill he shared with most of the men in his family, the ability to create something with one's own hands. The elder Capano founded Louis Capano and Sons, a construction company, and he developed and built apartment complexes and shopping centers all over Wilmington and all over Delaware, earning a lot of money in the process. Tom had four other siblings, an older sister, but he was the oldest of four brothers. And to basically everyone in his family, including his parents and siblings, he was the one who could be counted on. His brothers all admired him and wanted to be like him, and his parents depended on him to bring them pride. During the summer, all four boys were put to work in the family business, digging ditches, you know, lugging wood around. But during the school year, Thomas Capano buckled down on his studies. He attended St. Edmund's Academy for Boys during his elementary school days, and he went to Archmere Academy for high school. Now, these are both very prestigious, elite schools that are not cheap. They're expensive. It's like college tuition in high school. And Thomas Capano took advantage of everything his status offered him. In school, he excelled at both academics and athletics. He was always a straight-A student. He always had his nose in a book. He was also the captain of the football team, student council president, and he ran track. Thomas Capano's father was the epitome of the American dream. You know, a, a broke immigrant who came to this country to build a fortune, to make something of himself, to ensure that his children would have it better than he did and he succeeded very, very well. But Thomas Capano himself was the epitome of affluenza. He wasn't born with a silver spoon. He was born with a platinum ladle, and he was truly like an all-American type of kid, right? Good at everything, good in school, good at sports, just smart, funny, charismatic. Everybody wanted to be around him. Tom Capano's mother, Marguerite, would later say, quote, half the time, I didn't know he was around. All he did was want to read. He was not a problem at all. Never, 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 never. He studied all the time, end quote. She really did use four nevers. Uh, it wasn't me trying to be dramatic or exaggerating the situation. She used four nevers. Both at home and at school, people turned to Tom Capano to solve their problems or clean up their messes because he was a natural-born leader and he always kept a level head. He never lost his temper and he never made decisions based on emotion. People knew if they had an issue, Tom would fix it or he would tell them how to. His oldest sibling and only sister, Marianne, once said, quote, All mothers love their children the same, but there's always one child who is easier to like. Tom was easy to like. He was the golden boy. End quote. But it doesn't even seem like she said this with resentment. It was more of just a factual statement. And none of Tom's siblings seemed to mind that he always had first billing in the family. His brother, Louis, said that Tom was the perfect brother and a role model that he looked up to his entire life. After high school, Tom attended Boston College, where he met a young, pretty woman named Kay Ryan, who was studying to be a nurse. The two got married in 1972 and remained in Boston for two years while Tom finished law school. His entire education was paid for by his parents, so no pesky student loans to plague Tom Capano as he started out in life. And that does seem to be sometimes an issue with children of immigrants. The parents come to this country, they work really hard because they want to give their children a better life than they had, and because of this, this love, these good intentions, sometimes the parents just end up giving the kids everything, not making them work for it, which creates entitled, spoiled brats. Because I don't believe money is evil or bad innately. I think money is an admirable thing if you worked hard for it. It has value if you worked hard for it. But if it's just handed to you, it's worth less than nothing. Tom and his new bride returned to Wilmington in 1974, where he began working as a public defender. But two years later, he switched sides and began working as a prosecutor. And by 1977, he was working at one of Wilmington's largest homegrown legal firms, Morris, James, Hitchens, and Williams. Before the age of 30, Tom Capano was making six figures, and he and his wife were able to move to a house in the prestigious Highlands of West Wilmington neighborhood at 2500 West 17th Street. Over 8,000 square feet of luxury, including an elevator and a waterfall bathtub. A real estate agent said that you could land an aircraft carrier outside this house and you would never hear it inside. Beautiful home, beautiful life, made even more beautiful by the addition of children. In 1980, 
Tom and Kay's first daughter, Christy, was born, followed by Katie two years later, Jenny a year after that, and Alexandra in 1985. But while Tom Capano was busy adding on to his own immediate family, his extended family was struggling with a variety of issues. In 1980, Tom's father, Louis, died unexpectedly from a heart attack, and this threw Tom's youngest brother, Jerry, into a tailspin. While Jerry was enrolled as a student at the prestigious Archmere Academy, he started using drugs heavily. Weed, LSD, speed, quaaludes, cocaine, you name it, he was probably into it. But it did take him a while to get removed from the school since the Capano family had donated a small fortune to the academy. And that would have been an awkward conversation. Eventually, though, the school did have to ask Jerry not to return after his sophomore year because he was causing so many problems with the drugs. And so Jerry gave it a go at Brandywine High School, a public high school. But it didn't take long for him to end up in handcuffs and arrested on drug charges. The judge on this case was planning to send Jerry to Ferris School for Boys. That's a treatment facility for youth offenders. And let's be honest, Jerry probably could have benefited from this. But Tom Capano, golden boy, and the savior of the family, he swooped in and used his connections to keep his brother out of any facility, including jail. Jerry went to night school, he got his GED, graduated, and then he was sent away to the family condo in Boca Raton. A veritable sweeping under the rug situation. Basically, I think the family was probably embarrassed and they were like, get out of here, Jerry. Go to Florida where no one can see you. And uh, Florida's not the best place for somebody who has a drug problem. When he was in Boca Raton, Jerry attended community college. But like I said, I'm not sure why anyone thought his drug and alcohol problem would get better in Florida because it didn't. And he wasn't there long before he got arrested for drunk driving. But Big Brother Tom swooped in again and hired a former law school buddy to fix the Florida issue and bring Jerry back to Delaware, where he would now work at the family business and everyone could keep an eye on him. But that didn't really work out either. Jerry was not a reliable employee at all. I mean, are we surprised, right? He would often just not show up to work. When he did come into work, he was always late and miserable, and he would verbally abuse everyone around him, including customers, and lose his temper on a regular basis. So the Capano family, they were like, all right, you can't work here at the family business anymore. Uh, you're on your own. Like, we can't get you a job. We can't hide you in our Boca Raton condo. You have, you know, destroyed every one of these opportunities. You're on your own. And Jerry was like, yeah, that's cool with me, guys. That's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to not work because, hey, I have a trust fund. You know, my dad left me money. I have a trust fund. So don't worry about me. Um, and, you know, it wasn't going to be a really upward trajectory at that point with Jerry having all this time on his hands, no responsibility, and you know, pretty much an endless supply of money. See, when Lewis Sr. had died, he'd left a prosperous business and an estate worth at least $1.2 million, which included an apartment complex, a hotel in New Jersey, several housing developments, investment funds, and even a piece of a Pennsylvania coal mine. All of this went to his wife and five children. The three older sons, Thomas, Lewis, and Joseph, they were listed as trustees, and they were instructed to pay their mother, their sister, and their younger brother, Jerry, monthly stipends so that Jerry and Marianne and Marguerite could continue their lifestyles and not have to worry about, you know, money at all, ever. <laughs> but Jerry was not Tom's only problematic sibling. In fact, he seems to be the least problematic out of, out of all the boys, um, if, from what I know at least, which is kind of kind of scary, right? Seemed like everyone needed Tom to bail them out at one point or another. In 1982, his brother Lewis pled no contest to second-degree reckless endangerment when he was arrested after throwing a chair through the sliding glass door of his brother-in-law's home and then basically beating up his brother-in-law. We're going to come back to Lewis Capano, don't you worry. In 1984, Tom Capano worked on the campaign of Dan Frawley, who at that point was a city council member who was running for mayor. And apparently, Tom Capano's contribution to Frawley's campaign was considered to be so instrumental in getting Frawley elected to mayor that Frawley offered him the job of city solicitor, which Capano took even though it did mean a pay cut. But listen, in my opinion, Tom didn't do this because he didn't care about money or because he had enough or because he wanted to give back to the community. He didn't leave his six-figure job to make the world a better place, right? He did it to make connections in political circles. He was smart, a good lawyer, very capable, and all that is great. But what's better than a good lawyer? A good lawyer with friends in high places, right? Friends he might be able to call 
if he needs a favor. Friends who were politicians. Tom Capano knew the kinds of connections he wanted to make, the high upper echelon connections, could only be made if he was one of them, if he was on the inside, on the inner circle. And once he had formed those bonds, he could move on back to where the money was, taking with him those connections, those relationships, and a pocket full of favors owed to him. In 1988, when Dan Frawley was re-elected for his second term, Tom did not stay on with him because he was needed at home. His brother Lewis had found himself in some more trouble. In 1989, Lewis found himself at the center of a political corruption scandal, and the FBI had caught up with him. Lewis had no choice but to admit to the feds that he had given Newcastle County Councilman Ronald Aiello money for his campaign in both 1987 and 1988. And he had given him this money, not just out of the goodness of his heart to help his campaign, but with the strict understanding that the money would be in return for a favorable rezoning vote from ALO. And this shit happens so much, so much. It's unbelievable how much this stuff happens, how much politics and, and business are connected and how they just do favors for each other and they're up each other's asses and, you know, give me money and I'll make sure the vote goes your way. Like, it's so gross. Once Lewis was caught, he worked with the FBI to set ALO up and he got him on the record accepting a $25,000 bribe, which is so dirty, man. Like, you can't trust anyone. You can't trust anyone. They're all doing each other favors, but they're all going to turn on each other as soon as they can. You'd still think, though, that there might be some repercussions for Lewis because he engaged in illegal activity. But no, no, there wasn't. According to former mayor Thomas Maloney, Tom Capano straightened it all out for his brother, and he worked closely with the Justice Department to drop any charges against Lewis. Now, at this point, the matriarch of the Capano family, Tom's mother, she reached out to her golden boy and asked for his help getting the family business back on track with everything going on with Jerry, with everything going on with Lewis. What a mess. And Tom said he would help, but for one year, and he did, he kept his word. He worked with the family business for exactly 365 days, and then he quit and he began working as the chief legal counsel to the then governor of Delaware, Republican Michael Castle, which was odd. And it caused some like, you know, whispers behind the scenes because the previous politician that Tom had worked for, Frawley, he'd been a Democrat. And apparently in Wilmington, they are very serious about their party lines and like not crossing them. So he got the side eye a bit. You know, like, oh, you're working for a Democrat, now you're working for a Republican. Like, where do you stand? Where do you stand? Pick a side. But he didn't give a shit, right? Because the money was rolling in and he was making those connections that he wanted to make on both sides of the aisle. Under Governor Castle, Tom served on two blue ribbon panels. Uh, for one of these panels, he was tasked with investigating political donations made by Delaware law firms. How ironic. But the Capano brothers are not done with their shenanigans yet. In 1991, Tom's other brother, Joseph, was charged with the kidnapping and repeated rape of a 27-year-old woman on Halloween night. Joseph denied the charges. He said he had been dating this woman for a while and she had given her consent. But that's not the story she told. And his brother Tom, in his capacity as advisor to the governor of Delaware, once again swooped in and convinced the attorney general to let his brother plead guilty to lesser charges of assault, unlawful sexual contact, and criminal mischief, all of which came with zero jail time. It's just dawning on me. <laughs> but this is the Cuomo family, right? This is the Cuomo family. Hey, 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 I wasn't sexually harassing her. I'm Italian. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, let me tell you what Tom Capano was doing at the same time that he was digging his brothers out of all this trouble. And while he was walking around Wilmington, rubbing elbows with some very high up political figures. In 1977, when he had been married just five years, Tom became obsessed with a 27-year-old legal secretary named Linda Marindola. She worked as the secretary for one of Tom's friends at the law firm. And within no time, Tom had charmed her and flattered her and convinced her to go out to business lunches where they would chat and get to know one another. One evening, he ran into her at a bar in Wilmington, and I personally will say that I think this was no coincidence. He didn't just run into her. I think he probably stalked her there. There's no proof or evidence of this besides his pattern of behavior, which you will see come out as we talk. 
But I think he definitely followed her there and, and like, arranged them to just run into each other. And that night they talked and they drank before ending up in bed together. Now, when the harsh light of morning dawned, Linda was feeling guilty because she was engaged to someone else. And she knew that Tom was married. So she told him that this first time it was going to be the last time. But later at her bachelorette party, which Tom was invited to for some reason, she drank a little too much and she ended up back at his house while his wife Kay was out of town. He likes to bring women to his house because it's a big house. It's a nice house. He likes to impress them. Once again, you will see that this is a pattern. After this, Linda did avoid his advances, which were persistent. Like he was calling her all the time. He was showing up, trying to get her to go out with him again. And she made it to her wedding day without any more slip ups. But it turns out that Tom Capano was also an invited guest to this wedding. And on her wedding day, he hunted the bride down. He pulled her aside. He kissed her and he begged her to not get married because he was in love with her. Linda did get married, but Tom Capano did not stop. He called her constantly. He wrote her love letters telling her how brokenhearted he was that she'd gone through with the wedding. He begged her to acknowledge the fire that existed between them, the fire she would never have with her husband, and he told her to divorce her husband, and he would leave his wife, and then Linda could come and be his secretary. Ooh, I mean, it sounds like a sweet deal, Linda. Snap it up. You get to divorce your husband and then be some man's secretary. Maybe he'll even let you make his martinis. When his first child was born in 1980, Tom wrote Linda a letter telling her that he wished she had been the one to give birth to his daughter, Christy. Oh my God. I'd be so pissed. I'd be so pissed if I was his wife. Like, I understand men cheat sometimes and, you know, some, some women are okay with that or they turn a blind eye, but that would have been it for me. Linda did become more assertive in avoiding Tom's advances, and she kind of told him straight out, like, you know, I don't, I don't want to be in a relationship with you. We can be friends, but I'm married. You're married. You just had a kid. Like, this has to stop. And so Tom, who was so loving and gentle and flattering before, now he got mad, and he told her, this is my town, my state. You should leave or you'll be sorry. If you don't, I'll do everything in my power to make sure you go. Tom told Linda that he knew where she lived, where she parked her car. She started getting phone calls where, like, she'd pick up and no one would be on the other end. She just knew somebody was there, and they they kept calling back over and over. And then she received an eviction notice from her apartment complex, a complex owned by the Capano family. She'd been paying her rent. She hadn't been doing anything wrong. She was a good tenant. So at this point, she understood what was happening. This was targeted harassment, and she had enough. So Linda went to her boss and told him that Tom Capano had been harassing her. But remember, this guy, Linda's boss, also Tom's buddy and coworker. And he told Linda, listen, you know, Tom probably just got carried away. You know, he's not a man who likes to hear no. He'll get over it. He's a little intense, but he'll get over it. But Tom Capano did not stop. In fact, he took it up another level. He approached a man named Joseph Riley. So this guy, he was kind of like someone Tom Capano knew through being a lawyer. And Riley wasn't a lawyer, and he wasn't even really a criminal, but he was sort of known to be a wise guy. Like, he kind of considered himself, you know, a mobster of the Delaware streets. And Riley had told Tom before, you know, if you need anything handled, if you need to take care of anything, let me know. So Capano called Riley, and he said, listen, I want you to help me out with my heartbreak. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I'm crazy about this Linda woman. I can't live without her, and she just doesn't care. She's breaking my heart. And then he said, quote, I want to hurt this bitch. I want her hurt very bad. Could you get someone to knock her over the head or have her run over by a car? End quote. Riley was like, that's a little intense, man. You know, but of course he didn't say this out loud because... This guy on the phone just said he wanted someone to run his lover over with a car. So instead, Riley did nothing at first. He was hoping that Tom would, like, settle down and, you know, stop letting his emotions run him and some time and distance would, you know, ease the heartbreak and he would come to his senses. But a few weeks later, Tom Capano called Riley again and told him that he still wanted to get even with that woman. Riley knew that this was not going to go away, so he reached out to a friend of his, who was a retired FBI agent turned private investigator. This man's name was Dean Wedge, and Wedge told Riley to record his calls with Capano, which Riley did, and on the phone with Tom Capano, he got Tom to repeat 
what he wanted Riley to do. So he was like, oh, tell me again, you know, what is it that you want me to do with Linda? And Capano said, I want to hurt that bitch. He said it again. Now, Riley played this tape for Wedge and even for uh, Tom Capano's boss, but nothing happened. They just, like, locked the tape away, and Tom had, like, a good talking to at work, but it didn't make things better for Linda because now he was mad that she told on him. Tom Capano told Riley that he wanted him to harass Linda and her family, like call them, harass them, just be a complete nuisance. But he wanted this harassment of Linda and her family on tape so he could listen to it. He told Riley he wanted to listen to it so he could make sure that Riley was actually going through with it and Tom was getting what he paid for. But I think he just really loved to hear you know, these tapes of Linda being tortured and, you know, upset and stressed out. But Linda, bless her heart, she did not play along. Um, so when the calls came in, she would answer. And once she figured out it was like a harassment phone call, she just kept hanging up. So Tom told his buddy Riley, all right, if we can't get through to her, go after her new husband instead. Now, in 1987, Tom Capano called Linda for the first time in years. Uh, you know, they had had some space between them. I do believe that she left Wilmington and she was divorced. You know, it was a whole new life that she was living. And Tom Capano was calm and sweet and charming, like the guy she'd initially fallen for. So she agreed to let him take her to Atlantic City to celebrate her 33rd birthday. At the Seaside Resort, Tom proudly presented her with a present of a gold watch with two sets of initials engraved on the back, his and hers. She was grateful for the gift, but when Tom asked Linda if she'd been dating other men and she said she had been, he called her a whore and a slut and he stormed out of the hotel room, not returning for the entire night. But wait, there is more. Linda was not the only woman that Tom Capano was occupying his time with. He was also secretly seeing the wife of one of his fellow lawyers who worked at the same firm as he did. The men worked together. Their families lived close to each other. They would go to uh, the Jersey Shore in the summer for vacations together. And in general, they would just spend a lot of time together. They became friendly. And Tom had been eyeing Deborah McIntyre for years since he had first laid eyes on her. He knew that he wanted her, even while his wife was eight months pregnant. Tom made his intentions known to Debbie during a New Year's Eve party in 1981. He took her by the hand. He led her to a bathroom. He told her he loved her, and he began to kiss her. And apparently she had been feeling some sort of way towards him as well, because after that, Tom and Debbie were inseparable, and they would remain that way for over 13 years. Debbie was close friends with Tom's wife, Kay, who never suspected a thing. Debbie even helped Tom plan his wife's surprise 31st birthday that spring. Debbie would visit Tom at his firm, the same firm her husband worked at, <laughs> and she'd go into his office, and then they would make out like teenagers hiding from their parents. Debbie and Tom would giggle between kisses and, you know, groping each other, scared but also excited that someone could walk in and catch them at any moment. The couple would rendezvous at seedy motels and talk on the phone every day. So by 1983, Debbie thought Tom Capano was her soulmate. And when her husband filed for divorce, she didn't put up a fight. Debbie started going by her maiden name, and she moved into a nice house just a few blocks away from where Tom lived with his wife and four daughters, close enough to squeeze in an afternoon delight whenever they wanted to. But when Debbie asked Tom to leave Kay so that they could be together, he said no. He said he could not do that to his family. Oh, and these two had some kinky stuff going on, too. They liked to watch adult videos together. They were into voyeurism and group stuff. In fact, Tom had even once asked Debbie to let him know if she had a gentleman caller over because then he would sneak over to her house and hide in the bushes outside her window and watch Debbie and her date in bed. Tom had also invited one of his coworkers over to Debbie's house while he was advising the governor, and they'd had some drinks all together before Tom and Debbie invited their visitor to join them in the bedroom. So this is the kind of man we are dealing with. Before even knowing what his relationship with Anne-Marie Fahey was like, we can see several red flags. We can look at the way he becomes obsessed with women, much in the same way Scott Peterson and Chris Watts operated. But obsession is the best way to describe it because it, it wasn't ever a true connection, in my opinion. You know, his day-to-day -day life was not interesting enough. He needed to add some excitement, new experiences to get that adrenaline going, to feel that he was truly alive and powerful and desirable. 
And once he had convinced the women that what he felt was real, and once he had given them the security to feel something in return, he made it his mission to possess them, using control, threats, anything that would get him what he wanted. And while this is happening behind the scenes, Thomas Capano was creating a bulletproof armor of reputation and connections around himself. Everyone in Wilmington knew Thomas Capano, but they didn't know that Thomas Capano, right? There were some whispers about how he could be a little flirtatious, but he was also highly respected, highly competent. And not only that, he was incredibly well-liked. Remember, his sister said Tom was easy to like, gregarious, outgoing, charismatic, helpful, smart, funny. That was who the majority of people knew, and that was who Anne-Marie Fahey met and fell for in the spring of 1993. Unlike the pampered and privileged Capano, Anne-Marie was born into a life that did nothing but throw obstacles in her path at every turn. She was born on January 27, 1966, into a big Irish Catholic family. Her father, Robert Fahey, was an insurance salesman, and her mother, Kathleen, had been a secretary for DuPont before she got married to Robert. Kathleen was introduced to Robert, who I believe was about seven years older than her, through a family friend named Bill McLaughlin. And this man, Bill McLaughlin, would eventually go on to become Wilmington's mayor. After getting married, Kathleen stopped working to become a homemaker. and She went on to give birth to six children in 12 years. Anne Marie was the youngest, and her sister Kathleen was the only other girl, which meant that the two girls would be close for their whole lives. At first, things were okay. The family wasn't rolling in money, and both parents did enjoy their alcohol a little too much, but they lived in a nice little house in McDaniel Crest outside of Wilmington, and Robert was running his own insurance office. The children were all very good students, very athletic. Anne Marie played hockey and basketball in school, and she was an incredibly outgoing character for her whole life, with a face full of freckles and intelligent, bright blue eyes. She would spend a lot of time studying people's behaviors so that she could mimic them, so that she could do impressions of them, and her impressions were spot on. Every Sunday, the whole family would go together to Mass at St. Mary Magdalene Church, and what they lacked in money, they really did make up for in love and commitment. But tragedy struck in August of 1974, when Anne Marie's mother, Kathleen, was diagnosed with lung cancer. She would pass on just eight months later when she was only 45 and little Anne Marie was just eight. Now, the death of his wife threw Robert Fahey into a very dark place. He'd already been a heavy drinker, but now he drowned himself in it. He stopped going to work, his insurance office shut down, and before long he had burned through all of the family's savings. But that was not the worst of it for his children, who could have lived with less, but after losing their mother, they really could have benefited from having their father be a strong and supporting presence. And he just was not that. He wasn't that at all. He was a mess. He couldn't even be a strong and supporting presence for himself. Anne-Marie's older siblings did the best they could, taking care of her, parenting her, and their maternal grandmother began driving from Pennsylvania once a week to try and help out wherever she could, and other relatives also did what they could with their money and time, but it was really an uphill battle. The older kids got restaurant jobs to try to bring in some money for the household, but they would eventually graduate from high school and then leave for college. And that left only the three youngest siblings behind to deal with their father's inconsistent behavior. By the time Anne-Marie was 12, the electricity and water in the house were getting constantly shut off due to non-payment. And there were times in the winter when there was no hot water for showers. So Anne-Marie would have to go to school and shower in the locker room. Anne-Marie never knew what to expect from her father. He was always sad and he was always drinking. Some days he was listless, while others he would fly off the handle. Journalist Chris Barish wrote, quote, Sometimes he'd just scream at Annie. Other times he hit her. To protect herself from beatings, she learned to hide under furniture. Once she beat him with a hockey stick. Another time she punched him because he had stolen some of her money. At night after he passed out, she'd pour out the booze and hide the liquor bottles. End quote. This was obviously a less than ideal situation for a young girl, and Anne-Marie was understandably ashamed of what her life looked like behind closed doors, so she did everything in her power to hide the truth. She never had friends over. She would sneak out at night and sleep at the homes of her friends from school, and she put on this constant mask of lightheartedness that she was never actually feeling. 
Anne-Marie was known for her boisterous laugh. People said it would ring through a room and instantly make everyone feel happier. Like, she could be in a ballroom on the other side of the ballroom. You couldn't even see her. She would laugh, and you'd know she was there. She told jokes constantly. She was always messing around, teasing, laughing, even though she really didn't have anything to laugh about. Because Anne-Marie was overcompensating. She thought that if she acted like everything was all right, it would be. Anne-Marie was someone who was always on, right? She helped everyone with their problems. But as far as they knew, she didn't really have any problems herself, at least none that she discussed or complained about. When the family home was taken by the bank after months of the mortgage not getting paid, Anne-Marie moved in with her brother Brian for a while before graduating from high school and attending Wesley College in Dover on a partial field hockey scholarship. Now, unlike Thomas Capano, who had his college expenses paid for outright by his parents, Anne-Marie had to work several jobs in retail and food service to pay for the difference in her tuition that the scholarship did not cover. Now, happily, Anne-Marie's father, Robert, he did stop drinking, and he and Anne-Marie connected. They reconnected for a brief time while she was still going to school. But in 1986, he died suddenly and unexpectedly from leukemia, and his death hit her very hard because they'd basically just reconnected. They'd basically just found their way to each other again. She felt like, for the first time since her mother died, she had a parent again. And then he was taken from her. And this was very, very hard for her to process. After graduating from Wesley, Anne-Marie began attending the University of Delaware. She had a really tough time assimilating because she was very upset over what had happened to her father. And it was a much bigger school than Wesley. You know, Wesley and Dover was a smaller school, but the University of Delaware is a larger school, and Anne-Marie was feeling isolated in a sea of students. So she began locking herself in her dorm room, and by Thanksgiving of her first semester, she had dropped out. She lived with her brother Brian for a bit, and she started going to therapy before returning to Wesley College, where she majored in international relations and spent a semester in Spain, and that is where she learned to speak Spanish and love the Spanish culture. But during her last year at Wesley, Anne-Marie became obsessed with losing weight. She began exercising like three, four hours a day and taking laxatives, a lot of them, which is not a safe or effective way to lose weight. Like you don't lose weight taking laxatives, you just lose water weight. In 1989, she graduated with a degree in political science, and she got an internship with the Organization of American States in Washington, D.C., and there she translated documents from Spanish to English. But Anne-Marie didn't want to be in Washington. She wanted to be in Wilmington, where her friends and family were. So when her internship ended, she paid a visit to Ed Friel, an old family friend who was also the chief of staff to Congressman Tom Carper. Now, Ed's family owned and operated O'Friel's Irish Pub. This is a popular place for political up-and-comers to spend time in. You know, it's a restaurant, like an Irish pub. There's, there's music and a bar. It's great. And it was very well known that the Friel family owned it. And Ed also had a brother, Bud, who had dated Anne-Marie's sister, Kathleen, for almost seven years. So the two families were very close. So Anne-Marie felt that maybe Ed could help her find a good job in the Wilmington area in politics which was what she majored in, what she wanted to work in. When Anne-Marie walked into Ed Friel's office, he was out that day. He was actually on the road with Tom Carper. But she made such an impression on the staff who were left behind with her silliness and her big booming laugh and her little teasing insults that they called Ed and they put her on speakerphone so that she could yell, Fast Eddie, it's me, Anne-Marie. These people want you to hire me. And then everyone just started laughing. And, you know, Ed was completely, like, smitten. And, you know, even Tom Carper was like, yeah, hire that girl. You know, everyone was seduced by Anne-Marie's sparkling personality, including Tom Carper. So she was hired to be the congressman's appointment secretary. And when he ran for governor of Delaware in 1992 and won, she went with him. She worked on the 12th floor of the Carvel State Office Building in downtown. Downtown Wilmington. And she may have gotten the job as a favor, you know, she may have used connections that she had, but she did not take it for granted. She would go on to earn the respect that she'd eventually gain from everyone who worked with her or around her. She was the first person in the office every morning, 
And besides being good-natured and friendly to everyone, she was incredibly organized. And on top of all of her duties, and even on top of other people's duties, she was known for having a clever, witty sense of humor that could diffuse tense situations. She could get on the phone with a very irate person and have him or her laughing and telling her to have a good day within minutes. A very useful skill to have when you have an alcoholic father who might violently snap at any moment. So I do think this was a learned behavior. In 1991, though, still struggling with nagging emotions about her weight, Anne-Marie began to see a psychologist named Bob Connor, who she liked very much, and she trusted him enough to share with him all the things that had been weighing on her for years. Anne-Marie told Bob that she suffered from claustrophobia, panic attacks, lack of appetite, feelings of doom and powerlessness, overwhelming fatigue, the inability to assert herself, and a mood that could snap suddenly back and forth between good and bad. So needless to say, she was not in the best place mentally when she first encountered Thomas Capano in the offices of Thomas Carper. It started off as harmless flirting whenever Capano would need to come in for a meeting, and this flirting turned into business lunches with other colleagues, where Capano and Anne Marie would slyly exchange looks across the table while their oblivious guests enjoyed the lunch and the conversation. Soon, Anne Marie and Tom Capano were meeting for lunch privately, always in fancy and upscale places like the Green Room, located in the lobby of the Hotel DuPont. Over the next six months, Tom and Anne Marie built upon a friendship that they felt was based on mutual values and shared commonalities. Anne-Marie knew that Tom was married with four children, but he told her that he was unhappy in his marriage, and he had been for a long time. In turn, Anne-Marie shared with Tom that she feared she might never find the right guy to settle down with. He did not tell her that he was also sleeping with the ex-wife of his ex-co-worker. You know, he didn't tell her he had another woman behind the scenes. Capano liked how real Anne-Marie was. He loved her sense of humor, uh, the fact that she was open and transparent, and she kind of told it like it was. You know, she didn't hold back. He even liked that she had a little sass in her, kept him on his toes. The relationship was strictly non-physical until the night of Anne-Marie's 28th birthday, when Thomas Capano planned to bring her to an upscale Italian restaurant in Philadelphia called Ristorante Panorama. Obviously, he wanted to take her to Philly to avoid being spotted by someone they knew in Delaware, but an ice storm derailed these plans as they were driving to Philly. The ice started coming down, they were slipping all over, and the pair ended up at the Chart House in Penn's Landing, where they had several glasses of wine, toasted Anne-Marie's birthday, enjoyed a nice dinner, and then they went back to her apartment to be intimate for the first time. What followed was a whirlwind romance. Anne-Marie and Tom talked on the phone every day. They communicated regularly through email. Tom brought Anne-Marie to all his favorite restaurants in Philadelphia that she could never have afforded to go to on her own with her $30,000 a year salary. And he'd always order for her, right? She was 27, he was 44. This dynamic definitely gives me daddy vibes. You know, he wanted to show her the finer things. He chose a beautiful young woman who had never had two pennies to rub together so that he would be the only one who could open these doors for her. In March of 1994, Anne-Marie started writing in that rainbow-covered notebook, a journal that would later be found in her apartment when she was missing. The first entry seems to have been written by a woman who was in flux. She had only glowing things to say about her therapist, Bob Connors. She said he was one of the few people in the world that she knew would not judge her. She also wrote about her crippling fears, principally her fear of rejection and abandonment. And she mentioned that she was still obsessed with her weight. She had started taking laxatives again. She said she was happy with the amount of weight that she had lost, but her family had started to worry about her. And she said, quote, I am starving myself, as well as avoiding situations where food is involved. I now think of food as poisonous. I cannot ever imagine eating a sandwich. Too much food. I'll be okay. I will stop before it gets out of control. End quote. Anne-Marie also mentioned that the Ativan she had been prescribed was not working, so the doctors had switched her to Prozac. And she also wrote that she was in a relationship with a man, an older man who was a lawyer, and whose name she wouldn't say, but with whom she had fallen in love. She said, quote, We know who each other are. We have built an everlasting friendship. He makes my heart smile. He deserves some happiness in his life. It makes me feel good to know that I can provide him with such happiness. End quote. 
but from her journal, it is clear to see that the relationship between Anne-Marie and Thomas Capano was tumultuous almost from the very start. On March 24th, she wrote, quote, My boyfriend Tomas asked me today if I wanted to be a girlfriend and live alone, and he would pay rent for my room. I need to think. I love him, but he has four children and a wife. I will be a silent girlfriend. Oh, God. End quote. So basically, at that point, Anne-Marie lived with roommates, and Thomas Capano was saying, if you're my girlfriend, my private secret girlfriend, then I'll, I'll put you up in your own place that we can spend time together in. The next month on April 24th, Anne-Marie wrote, quote, I had a great day on Friday. My friend and I went to his house to eat. What a house. He enchants me. During the weekend, my thoughts are devoted to Tomas. I am afraid because I am in love with a man who has a family. I need to realize that our relationship will never be anything other than a secret. I fantasize about my life with him all the time. He is very gentle, intelligent, handsome, and very interesting. Why does he have to be married? End quote. So just in the same way that she gave her boyfriend, Mike, the nickname Miguel, she gave Thomas Capano the nickname Tomas. But then just two days later, on April 26th, Anne-Marie wrote, quote, Wow, what a day. I talked with Tomas last night. Our relationship is finished. He told me I need to find a man without children who has a lot of time for me because I am very special and I deserve much more. After what he said, I was very sad and cried all night. I know it is my problem and my fault because from the very beginning, I knew what I was getting myself into. Sometimes it is very easy to write but very difficult to cope. I have dreams about him and me making love and living together, but it will never happen. After he left, I was so empty, sad, lonely. I told him things that were hidden inside me. I feel so comfortable with him. I can say anything. I watched him get in his car and drive away. I went to bed and cried myself to sleep. Ciao, T. I love you. End quote. But after all of this heartbreak, all the tears, the triggering, really, of Anne Marie's fears of abandonment, Thomas Capano wasn't done with her at all. I think that this was a, a tactic he used. He called her the next day and he told her they could still be together. You know, he couldn't live without her. He loved her. But he would be unable to see her for a few days because he had to travel to Montreal for a law school conference. This was true. But he did not go to Montreal alone. He was accompanied by his other secret lover of 13 years, Deborah McIntyre. But that didn't mean that Thomas Capano was not still gung-ho about having Anne-Marie Fahey completely to himself. She didn't know that he was dating other women, seeing other women, spending time with other women, and she didn't need to know that. She didn't know that she was becoming his property. She didn't know that every fancy dinner or expensive gift came with strings attached. She didn't know that he was keeping a tally of all of these things, of what he had given and what was owed. And she didn't know that if she chose to end the relationship, that if she found someone, another man who was unmarried, who wanted to be with her and her alone, the same kind of guy that Thomas Capano had told her to go find, had told her that she deserved. She didn't know that if she decided to be with that man and end the relationship with Capano, there would be hell to pay. And that is where we are going to end today's video. Thank you so much for being here. Let me know what you think about this case in the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. YouTube unsubscribes people from my channel all the time. They're such control freaks. They must have taken a lesson from Thomas Capano. You know what I mean? <laughs> like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Also, don't forget to follow me on social media. And don't forget to follow my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every single week with retired police detective Derek Lavasser. We cover a new case every week. New episodes go out on audio platforms every Friday. And then our YouTube video will usually follow up the following Wednesday. Thank you guys so much for dealing with me during this video. I know my voice probably sounds weird and it was cracking at some points and I had to take a lot of breaks, but we got through it. And now I've got to edit this so I can get it out to you guys as soon as possible. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe. And I will see you guys very soon for part two. Well, that's part four. Part two. Part two. I will see you very soon. Bye.
So you got to let it go I got blood 